When you want to create something for yourself, you have to create it inside of yourself. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is on imagining and creating a better future for ourselves and our world. So very aligned with the mission of this podcast. It's an interview that will lift you up and inspire you to dream bigger. We also do a really powerful meditation in this episode, which I highly recommend you do. It actually brought me to tears. Like you'll, you'll see if you watch the video podcast on YouTube. Our guest today is Future futurist, philosopher, spiritual teacher, and filmmaker, Michael Sean Conaway. Michael Sean Conaway is endlessly curious about how life works, why we do the things we do, and how we might live our lives boldly. His purpose is to illuminate people's true nature, to give insights and tools to transcend our collective trauma and generate a thriving future for humanity. Boldly You, his life development platform, was founded to help you discover your life path and adopt a life of learning and growth. He is the award-winning film director of We Rise Up, a philosopher, spiritual teacher, and frequent speaker who is out to help you thrive in your life. Hello, Michael. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you feeling today? Yeah, I'm really good. I'm in the Netherlands, and that means I get to go outside on my bike and get to walk around a lot. I had a, a, a nice day out of the house, so I'm, I'm really in a great space today. Oh, that sounds so nice. Are you originally from Europe, the Netherlands? No, but when I was about 19, I grew up in New Mexico. And when I was about 19, a friend of mine moved to Germany. And then I, after that, I just started traveling back and forth. So I've kind of lived half of my life over here and half of my life in the States. Oh, okay. And then now you're just based there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, we do a nice. lot of work here and in Asia and Middle East. So this is a bit easier for us to get around all those places than the US. Oh, amazing. Okay, so why don't you start by describing what you do? How do you describe what is a generative futurist? Sometimes it's easier to describe what it's not. So uh, I started off in uh, high tech and futurism and, and helping companies see what the future trends of technology and things would be. That's what we call predictive futurism. You take all of the trends and things and look forward and say, hey, AI is going to be really big in five years. It's not super hard. Uh, there's a lot of people that get paid a lot of money to do it, but in, in general, it's just projecting. Generative futurism is using your imagination and creativity to imagine or think about a future that you might want to have. Like um, we could imagine a future with no hunger on the planet. So what would it really look like if nobody ever went hungry anymore? Well, it would look like people had access to good quality food. Well, how would we do that? Well, we'd have to change the way that food gets grown maybe or how it gets distributed. And so you begin to think through the ways that your imagined future might be able to take place. Uh, the reason this is so important is because uh, our civilization, our society, and especially our businesses tend to work on an incremental basis. They just do a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better. The problem is, is with these, these hard problems, um, climate change, our fuel that we use, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. I mentioned hunger, inequality. These kinds of things are big, big problems. We actually have to tackle them in a much more systemic way. So in generative futurism, we just think about how to do that. And I do that for governmental organizations, companies, but I also do it inside of personal development. Like for you, what would be a generative future? What would be a future in five years that you're just like, wow, I'd love to have that life. I'd love to have that future. And then we do the same te technique. We just think backwards, think that. all the things you'd have to do, plan it out and let you execute on that future. I think that's so interesting. And you know what you just described? That's exactly what I like to do with my own personal life. I do it on a personal scale. And, you know, I like to dream ahead, okay, in five or 10, 50 years, what am I doing? And I try to create that actively. And that's what I talk about with my audience. But you're talking about this on a macro big scale. How do we create a new version of the world? And that's really inspiring to me. I think that's also something a lot of people want to be able to, to do, but it's so big and it's so, how do you even begin to, to make that kind of change? So how, I mean, tell me your story on, on how, what led you to, to down this path and to actually make a career out of it. I'm a creative, I'm a, I was an ADD kid. So I was doodling or staring out the window or doing anything other than, than school uh, for the longest time. Uh, when I was like 18, 19, if you met me, you'd be, I'd be probably saying, where are my keys? Or 
wow, did I just miss a class two years, two, two hours ago? I was just so not anchored in time or anchored in, in uh, like a normal functioning way of being a human in, in many ways. And I was, but I was also really sensitive and really curious, very spiritual kid. And in 19, I stumbled on a book called Zen and the Art of Archery. And it was explaining states of mind and mental states that I found really fascinating. And so I thought, wow, I'll try this meditation thing. I'll try, because if, if I can get that from meditation, then that that sounds amazing. So I started meditating. I started a martial arts, Aikido. Uh, so both Zen, uh, Zen and Aikido are both Japanese traditions. And um, slowly but surely, I got my life. I like got, I could achieve things. I could make it to class on time. I still lost my keys from time to time, but I started like getting some kind of functioning capacity past just being a, a you know kind of crazy spacey person. And at some point it, it clicked that what I was doing wasn't just about me. It clicked that because in the Eastern tradition, it's all about the the collect the collective, uh, all of people. You don't you don't make your life better for yourself, you make your life better for everybody else. And that really started me into this question. It's like, well, if I could make my life better, if I could figure out how to to become productive, to get to my college degree, to to do all these things that I thought maybe I wasn't gonna be able to do, then could I help other people? Could I help? Could I help larger systems of people with you know my gifts and skills, which are different than everybody else's, but uh, applicable in this this domain for sure? So from there to getting a degree in writing, I went to a Buddhist university, Naropa Institute in Colorado. I spent a lot of time in India and Nepal. More meditation, more wow. meditation. Eventually started mm-hmm. doing creative work for advertising agencies. Became a, a director, commercial director. Did. A lot of uh, top, you know, HP, um, Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera, top commercials. And then suddenly I realized, wow, now I know how to film make. Mm-hmm. And I do still care about people and I don't care about advertising so much. So that was when we really focused on how do we make films or make meditations or make experiences to help people up level their life. Eventually that came into the corporations and they started asking me to lead these, what we call future searches. So we look five and 10 years ahead for a company and help them to imagine something that might be better for themselves in the world. So it's not really a career as much as just this falling forward into the the next thing that I was good at, but also felt made a difference for other people. And at this point, I couldn't imagine, like I wake up every morning trying to figure out how to make the world better for people. And that's what makes me come alive more than anything else. Wow, that's amazing. So it's not like it really is. You just took one step, and then you ended up here, and then you ended up here. But you were led by by this general mission and this, like this gift that you have for helping people create the future. Yeah, I, and I think that could be the way it is for everybody. I think it's possible that we all tune into our soul's purpose, our, our kind of our deeper longing as a human being, and then start to realize that. And, and you should know, you've, you've directed your, I can tell in your podcast and the way you show <laughs> things, your passion, I can see that showing up. Now it may not be so clear where it, it's leading you in 10, 15 years, but I promise you when you look back in 10, 15 years, you'll be like, oh, that was perfect. I couldn't have planned it any better. And I think that's how we know we're on the, on the right path or on the right journey when it doesn't make sense always, but we know that, that the next thing is the right thing. The next step is the right step. All right, let's take a break to hear about today's sponsor, Paired. Valentine's Day is around the corner. If you're not into gift giving or just looking for something new to do, here's a way to spark a meaningful connection between you and your partner. Paired is an app that offers daily questions, games, and guided conversations designed by experts that allow you to deepen your relationship every day. Research shows that everyday moments of connection are what matter most in a relationship, and the Paired app sends you daily prompts to increase connection and intimacy with your partner. The best part? You don't get to see your partner's answers until you answer them yourself. Wilson and I played a couple games on the app and it was fun to answer new questions about each other and see what we guessed right or wrong about each other's preferences. Even after 16 years together, there are still new things we can learn about each other. So for a Valentine's Day gift that lasts well beyond the holiday, head to paired.com slash TLL to get a seven day free trial and 25% off if you sign up for a subscription. Just head to paired.com slash TLL to sign up today. Connect with your partner every day using Paired. A happier relationship starts here. If you care, you pair. 
did that come natural to you throughout your life? Like just following your intuition, following that next step? Or was it, was it difficult? Were you like, oh, I have no idea what I'm doing? And tell us how you kind of navigated that. I was incredibly naive about everything. I remember telling my wife, uh, we were traveling in Laos, and I said, I'm going to be a, a television commercial director. And she said, oh, you're going to go to film school? I said, no, I'm just going to go back to LA and, and start directing commercials. And uh, she came from that world. She's a, a film producer and had a lot of experience. And she's like, well, I don't know. That's, that's a tall order. Uh, and sure enough, we came back. Uh, we actually came to the Bay Area. And within 18 months, I was directing international uh, national spots and big campaigns and stuff. Um, part of that was like good fortune, you know, like being in the right place at the right time. I did my first television commercial with uh, Olympic sprinter Michael Johnson for MD NBC Sports, like um, talking about the Olympics. And I'd done some commercials with uh, animation in them. And they asked me to do this commercial with Michael Johnson, said, he's, he's, a, he's available, can you go shoot him? And they didn't ask me if I'd ever directed a live action <laughs> commercial. Oh my god! They didn't gosh. know. But I, so I said, yeah, I'll go you do that. You just played the part. Did it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But figure it out as you go along. I think that's that's that thing about saying yes to life, you know, uh, even if you're scared, like say yes to life. And then also say yes to life with a great team of people around you. Um, my wife who came out of the business when I did that first live, live action commercial, she put real pros with me, like oh, veteran wow. camera people, veteran sound people. So you Everybody had a good there was, team. They knew what they were yeah. doing. And so it was easier yeah. to like lead them. Yeah. And I think, I think when we do it, like if we're a rookie and we surround ourselves with rookies, it's really hard. Um, and I think that, that, that extends through all every, every area of business where you're going to uplevel your life. You got to find people who be the, the mentors, the pushy angels, the, the, the ones that say, that's a great idea. Maybe you should try expressing it like this or trying this because this is, this is what works. Now, sometimes you want to break from that, but in general, you've got to have that expertise, even if it's not in you. I think that's the way we make these kind of big leaps forward. Yeah, honestly, that's such a great tip. And I was going to talk to you more about that. Like, you made such a big leap because you're all about like creating the future. Is it, do you call it manifesting or how, what is your process of like, I don't know, oh, I'm just going to do this and boom, it happens? Because it's a mindset thing, right? It goes deeper than the decision. A lot of people want to do big things. How did you approach that? I kind of approach this like a technology now. The first thing is kind of a little bit like manifesting this imagining thing. And when we, we lead imagination, we, we want you to imagine. So, hey, Eileen, I want you to imagine five years in your life. Uh, you know, what, where do you live? Uh, who are you with? Uh, what does it feel like in your body to be there? Imagine three things that happened in the year five years uh, ahead and then pick one thing and then we're going to really expand upon that. Like, mm -hmm. how, how's, that, how's that working? How's that feel? And then we, we create instead of a, a vision. We actually create a world. We create this mm -hmm. whole future out there and make it really, really rich. Sometimes um, I've heard other people leading, like, make it like a movie. I'm like, no, don't make it like a movie. Make it like real life. Like wow. make it as real for yourself as you can. So you can know what it feels like and tastes like. And then not like manifesting. The part where manifesting fails over and over again is somebody comes up with something they want, but then they sit in their apartment waiting for it to happen. If the, if the universe gave you all of your wishes, but they, they delivered the wishes three blocks away, are you not going to get up out of your apartment and walk three blocks to find the miracles? And so um, you may have a vision, but you actually have to go out and walk the streets to find the miracles, whether that's through your network or your friends or, or whatever you're doing. You have to go out there seeking for the response to your vision. Mm -hmm. And it may not come back exactly like you look like it looks like for you or the way you imagine the next step being. But if you're a yes to the things that lead you in the direction of your future, then you're always making progress. Now that future may take longer than five years. You may get revised, whatever, but you're on the road. And so there's part imagining and then part action. So you have to imagine and then take action. You have to imagine again and take action again and get feedback from the world and so my, most people say, that sounds kind of like normal life. I'm like, yes, it is, except <laughs> you just imagine bigger than everybody else. <laughs> you wow. just imagine things that are wilder and crazier. And then let's, let's see what comes to pass. Let's see yeah. how the universe connects the dots for you. Um, yeah. And you can see, I get really excited about it. I no, excited I love, I love talking about this. <laughs> I, I want to like understand everything you understand. <laughs> well, what about like imposter syndrome or like self-doubt? Because that's really common too, as you're imagining so big, you know, kind of like how you were given that director role, anyone could have been like, I can't do this. I've never done it before. So, so, so what is your advice to people? Yeah, this is a really tough one right now, especially there's so many, um, 
there's so much feedback about not being enough. You know, um, social media is really great because it gives us a really rich world of ideas and things coming back to us. But there's this self-reflective nature where like, oh, I'm not as good looking as that person. Or, man, I can't do that yoga pose like that person. And while I didn't make seven figures last year, my, my, my money's not you know, nearly as good. My success is not as good. And so I think this constant comparing puts us at a really great disadvantage. When you want to create something for yourself, you have to create it inside of yourself. It's not created in comparison to the world. So you may go out and say, look, I actually remember uh, when I first met my wife, I got a job as a school teacher at the time. I moved from Albuquerque, New Mexico to LA and I got a job uh, and I made $32,000 a year. And I was so proud of myself. I was like, I am rolling in the dough. I I can pay my bills every month, not just every other month. Yeah. And she laughed. She says, I pay my assistant the same amount you're making as a school teacher. But I said, <laughs> but I've never made that much money. So it feels great. And, um, you know, so if, if it's inside of yourself, you know, I speaking of school teachers, I have a huge amount of respect for the profession and people do it. I know many school teachers that are still only making, you know, 50, 60,000 a year, but they live great lives. So, that's living inside of yourself and living inside your dream, whatever that is. So don't look to other people is the very first thing. And then if it's your dream, if it's inside of you, just understand that the universe is going to give you everything you need to achieve that dream because it's yours. If it's somebody else's dream, you may not have that. So you see the, the guy mm-hmm. in the Lamborghini and that, that might be their dream, but it's not, if it's not really meant for you, then it's going to be a hard thing to to go to. I was meant to, to direct films. I was meant to lead future searches. I was meant to do these things. So when I said yes to the incremental steps, it showed up as like, I can do this. I, I This is inside of my gifts and my, my purpose. And there's some times where I had to learn, sometimes where I had to make mistakes to learn. But um, as long as it's yours, like if you've got a baby, like you're going to make mistakes being a mom or a dad, but if it's when it's your child, you do extraordinary things for them. Well, that should be the same with your future. You should hold it like a child and protect it and nurture it and know you can do it. I love that. Yes. Yes. You'll feel that like light. You'll, you'll light up from inside if it's the right path. Yeah. And I want to say, if it doesn't, if these things don't happen for you, if you're listening to this, it's like, well, I've never felt that. I've never had that happen before. It's okay. And like I said before, in order to have that thing happen, the first thing you've got to do is imagine. You've got to get into action. So your actions might be, hey, I think I'll meditate on that. I'll do some something that will, I'll start drawing. I'll do dream journaling. I'll do, there's so many things out there. I'll start taking actions that allow that dream to come forth. There's no place that you are in your life where you can't imagine a new future for yourself, even if you don't think you can do it or haven't ever done it. And so I think Little steps to big steps, big steps to worldwide steps, I think is the path. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you talk about meditation and you definitely have a lot of experience <laughs> with meditation. You, you've been doing it so long. Um, so how does that inform like your practice? Because is this something that you're constantly doing? Like, is it, is it part of your routine to imagine the future? Like, what do you do personally? Great. Uh, it's, so it's two worlds. I said, I, I in my er, late late teens, early 20s, became a, a Buddhist and a very serious uh, practitioner of that stuff. Um, and that was always kind of separate from my creative work and my business. Uh, as I progressed on and started getting into what I'd call more philosophical domains, we're talking about how to change the world, why to change the world, how to change yourself and why, what's really there for us. I realized that I had insights that other people didn't have because I meditated. So I thought, okay, I don't want anybody to do what I have to do, go sit in a Zen monastery and face a wall and not move for hours in a row to have this kind of deepening and awakening. I said, how could I use what I do already to make this easy for people? So I started leading guided meditations and that's I do that a lot. And I have people who have never, never meditated before who can create futures and imagine things they've never imagined before mm. and bring that practice. It may not look like a traditional Japanese Buddhist practice, but bring the quality of that experience into their lives in a very simple way. I think in a way, it's like one of the biggest breakthroughs I've ever had in leading and teaching people is when I stopped telling people what to look for and started just showing them. It's like, okay, you can take my word for this. You can think I'm a really smart guy and you can think I know how the universe works, but I'd actually rather you sit down and consider this thing for a minute to be quiet in your own body and see what, what shows up for you then you really learn it. 
it's like you'll forget me in in a in a week or two maybe but the meditation the experience you have maybe you carry that with you for a lifetime and i have to imagine that's what the 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 masters in the past figured out too i'm just a little bit slower than they are <laughs> i didn't figure it out so soon so they figured out wow i've got to find a way to get people to have this experience because if they don't experience it then it's not really worth that much to them so yeah i use it a lot i use it in funny i i um I do these meditations with CEOs, like, you know, big, important CEOs. And I don't call it a meditation, by the way. Anybody, if you're in the audience, don't let on to the CEOs that these are meditations <laughs> I'm doing. I call them what do you call contemplations. Them? So oh. we do contemplations. I'm going to, you're going to close your eyes and contemplate something. Uh, for yeah. Um, and so I get these rooms of, you know, three and 400 people closing your eyes and doing these, these contemplations. And it doesn't matter who you are. You can be a CEO and you can still have a deep meditation experience, even if you've never done it before. And I think that's what's so exciting right now is this, I don't know, I guess I just have complete permission to do crazy things with people now. <laughs> Hi, love. Let me take a quick break to recommend another podcast by our friends over at Asian Boss Girl. Asian Boss Girl is a podcast for the modern day Asian American woman. On the show, you'll find conversations about navigating the corporate world as a person of color, mental and emotional health as children of immigrants, interviews with inspiring Asian women and men, and even blind dates recorded on the mic. Mel, Helen, and Janet started Asian Boss Girl as girlfriends while balancing full-time corporate careers. What started as a passion project turned into a multimedia business that they now run full-time. You can catch new episodes every Thursday and also enjoy over 180 episodes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or any podcast app. Just search Asian Boss Girl. When you're talking about this, like you have to experience it in your body. I almost want to ask you to like give us an example and leave maybe just like five minutes. Because I, I want to see you, how you do it. Great. So I, I got a couple of things that that are really easy to get into. Um, the first thing, maybe the thing we do is I, I, let's. I want to take you on a journey. So we'll just have a a, a quick journey. And what what I want to do with this journey, and you guys check me off if you kind of get five ten minutes from now and get to the end of this. You just check me on this and see if this feels like something that altered who you are in the world. So. Um, Everybody will close their eyes and just sense your body in space. It's like, where are you? Maybe you've been leaning forward, but you're not comfortable. Maybe you're doing something, and now I'm asking you to close your eyes. So just find a place you can sit down. It doesn't have to be on the floor. It could be in a chair. Um, just any place that you can be comfortable for a minute. Sense the, the boundaries of your body. Like, we don't... We don't consider so much where we end and the world begins. But where are you in space? We're going to feel into the center of our body now. And I want you to do three breaths with me. And this is a breath that's going to interrupt your patterned brain. We're going to hold our breath at the top when we finish in inhaling, and we're going to hold our breath at the bottom when we finish exhaling. So inhale with me and hold and exhale and hold. Inhale and hold. Exhale and hold. Inhale one more time and hold. Exhale and let your breathing return to normal rhythm. And I want you to imagine yourself now floating in space. You're standing, but the space around you is empty. It's a calm and safe space that feels familiar and very, very comfortable. Now I want you to imagine your parents standing behind you, one on either shoulder. And if they were 
inclined to do so and you are comfortable with them doing this, please let them put a hand on your shoulder. Imagine them standing behind you with their hands on your shoulder and now imagine their parents standing behind them. Your grandparents with their hands on your parents' shoulders and your parents with their hands on your shoulders. And now imagine your great-grandparents behind them, three generations back, and their parents behind them, four generations back. You may not even know the names of your fourth generation back great-great-grandparents. Maybe the nickname they had but imagine them four generations lined up behind you and five generations, their parents behind them. Like I say, this is far beyond what most of us can remember, but we are going to continue back through time, generation by generation, six generations, seven generations, eight, nine, ten generations. This is back to the time of the founding early days of the idea that became the United States of America, that became the French Revolution, the economic system we have today was invented at 10 generations back. And we'll go a little faster to 15 generations behind you, 20 generations behind you. This is 500 years in the past, about the time at the end of the Renaissance, and with 11, 12 generations, we can see Michelangelo carving David out of stone in Italy. 15, 20 generations, 25, 30 generations, 35 generations, and back to the time of Rome and the, and the emperors going to go back 40 and 50 generations and 60 generations were back to the time of the Buddha, the time of, of Christ. We're going to go back 70, 80 generations and 90 generations. And we're going to arrive in Plato's Academy in Greece, the root of our Western knowledge. And I want you to imagine a hundred generations behind you and know that every single person in those 100 generations was required, was absolutely essential for you to be. If any one of them did not have a life, you would not have been born. Your life is literally given by a hundred generations and more. And everything that you know, the language you speak, all of your knowledge, everything that this world is was given to you, worked through generation by generation. Each generation giving their gifts and living their passion and purpose to create a step forward. And it's all flowing to you in this moment. We'll come back now from 100 to 50 to 30 to 20, 10 Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and back to now. I want you to feel that arrow shape of a hundred generations standing behind you. And at the same time, I want you to imagine the generation before you. Maybe you have children, or you're dreaming of having children, or maybe your brother or sister has a child. But imagine a child in front of you and place your hand on the shoulder of that child, knowing that you are giving your life and support to that child. And imagine their children in front of them, your grandchildren to be and imagine their children in front of them, your great-grandchildren to be, and your great-great-grandchildren in front of them. And you have reached out and put your hand on the shoulder of your children, and each generation is reaching forward, placing their hands on the generation before them, 
at four generations, your name may no longer be known, but you are part of their ancestry now. And I want you to imagine a gift, some beautiful gift that you could give forward in time. Maybe it's a, a value or a way of being, or I want them to be safe and protected. And I want you to imagine that gift coming from your heart and transmission, transmitting generation by generation to your fourth generation. And then you're going to see that gift go forward to five generations and 10 and 20 generations and 30 generations. At 30 generations, you will have a billion descendants. If you can give a gift of love and heart forward 30 generations, you can touch the lives of a billion people. 40 generations, 50 generations, 60 generations, 70, 80, 90, and 100 generations in front of you now. See them spreading out wide. You have no idea where their lives will lead, but if you have given your gift to them, you know that the future they live will be enriched by your life. A hundred generations, 2,500 years into the future. Just imagine all of your descendants and the great things they will do. The crazy adventures they may have. And I want you to come back to now from 100 to 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I want you to hold your hands out in front of you, maybe place them palms up on your lap. In your left hand, I want you to hold a hundred generations back, 2,500 years of time. And in your right hand, I want you to hold a hundred generations into the future, 2,500 years. You're holding a 5,000 year arc of time. You're holding it connected to your ancestors and your descendants. And you can feel in this moment time flowing through you. This is your moment to live your life and give your gifts and change the future for everyone. Now take your hands in that 5,000 years of the gifts you've received and the gifts you re you've given and place them on your heart. Just fold your hands up and place them on your heart. Take a deep breath with me in and exhale. One more time in and out. Let this soak into your being that you are beyond what you thought you were. You have more ability to hold vastness than you've ever known. The universe is conspiring with you to give your gifts. Now when you're ready, you can open your eyes and arrive back into this moment, a bigger person than you've ever been before. <laughs> Sorry beautiful. about the tears, that happens No, <laughs> that's so beautiful. I That was so empowering to visualize like how big that many generations are and also i just got emotional because you know when you're thinking about your parents and the people behind you they're 
even with the parents, there's a little bit of a trauma, a little bit of like, mm, do I want them to put their hand on me? <laughs> there's a little bit of that. But then once it becomes to like, oh, your future kids or your, you know, the future generations, then it starts to get more emotional because you're, because then you just have so much love and so much like, oh, I do have so much that I want to give. And oh, that was really cool. Thank you for sharing. I was like, wow, the universe, the t- time is flowing through me. Right. I That's love right. That. I think of it sometimes like you're a, a bead on a, a strand of 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 twine or a cord like around your neck. And that's that present moment. And it's just sliding along. And we only have in our experience this present moment. That's the only thing we're gifted. We don't ever get to be in the past. We never get to go be in the future. Now we can imagine them just like we did. We have this amazing capacity to imagine. Did you ever think you could travel five thousand years that you'd be a time traveler? No, but in 10 minutes, you, you easily did it. Yeah. Like it's a, everybody listening to this podcast is gifted. You're gifted by being a human being, have this capacity to imagine these just amazing things. Um, the problem is that sometimes we don't imagine, that we get our imagine, imagination gets turned down to one instead of turned up to 11. And so I'm, I'm all for everybody turning it up. I love that. Thank you for that. I just think so many people, there are, their framework of the world is so like in this life and they're just, I I think once you take that step back, like a huge step back, you realize, oh, there's the possibilities are endless. Like I can use my life to do anything to shape the future of the world. And it it becomes very empowering. Like each one of us has a gift that, and we can influence it, influence the world in some way. We shouldn't just, just judge the size of our gift. Um, there's so many stories of people being touched by just one random act of kindness and changing their lives. You may not even know the the good that you spread. And if you give a lot of good and you do as much as you can, then you have you you up the odds of of you know being a good ancestor to your descendants. And I think that's a beautiful way to conduct our lives. I think there's so many things that um, society has us chasing after, you know, wealth, um, fame, whatever, a better job, a better, a better partner. And most of them actually are only satisfying for just a little while. And then we're left back with who we are. And if who we are is someone that uh, finds meaning in life, has purpose, and does our life's work in the world, then no matter what changes or alters, we'll always have that. We'll always have the, I'm here for a reason. I count, I matter. And even if nobody notices what I do in the world, it still makes a difference. Yes. Love it. Let's move on to talk about your film, because I want to bring that up, We Rise Up. So you mentioned that you've been a filmmaker for a while. So like, what was your journey leading up to creating something like this? Yeah, we started with, you know, $3 million budget commercials. <laughs> when I first started directing, I went from zero to hero in a, a very short period of time. Um, and within about four or five years, of that, got really burned out on that. It was, um, it was exciting work. I learned to be a filmmaker doing it. But you would work for two months and then your commercial will be on TV for a few weeks or maybe a month or something like that. And then it would be gone. And it always felt like you're uh, like a hamster on a wheel. You run really Mm -hmm. fast and then you produce something really cool and then it's gone. And then you start all over again. And that's what really got me thinking about impact. I got to do something, a bigger impact. So for quite a while, we just made films that were kind of philosophical business, business films, like uh, how to be aligned in your teams or how to get, uh, how to be connected to people or how to uh, eventually how to have business that makes a positive impact in the world. Um, We did some branding and advertising on a small scale for you know, really good companies that were doing good stuff. But through this whole process, I just kept thinking like, well, how do I like do this where other people can figure out what maybe good might look like? And so uh, we started making this film a number of years ago. It's been about seven years ago that we came Mm. up with the idea and started working on it. And it was just really, what if we changed our model of success from consumption? How do I get a lot of stuff? How do I show everybody else that I got a lot of stuff to a model of contribution? What if the most successful person on the planet was the one that made the most contribution, that had the biggest impact, that had the did the most giving in their life? Wouldn't that would that be interesting? So that's what we started with, and um, I interviewed over 150 people from, uh, you know, 
Blake McCoskey at time, Tom Shoes to the Dalai Lama to um, Tony Robbins, like anybody I could find that had something to say about this model of contribution as far as success was concerned, I would sit down and interview with them. Uh, and that's all I did for quite a while. Alex would, would set things up. I have another partner, Kate, who kind of helped put all that thing together. And um, so in the end, the film became about what's a model of success for people that surrounds contribution. What if I give my gift and live my purpose? And then showed companies, people who run companies that actually have an impact to do good with their business. And then finally, we considered this larger spiritual topic of like, what is the universe up to with this consciousness thing anyway? And where are we going? And why is like why does why does consciousness seem to want to grow? And why why is it important to have this kind of larger arc of consciousness? Um, Prince EA came. I don't know if you know he's a YouTube influencer. He came and did. Um, I, I wrote poems and he did poems. So that he's a narrator in the film. And like I just there's about I don't know, about a hundred people. You go like wow, they're in the film. Like so many people gave their time to be in it. It's a super film. There's like so many like big names in there, like Dwight Howard, Dalai Lama. So yeah, I mean, I'm just curious, how did you gather all these thought leaders? Was it easy? Was it because of the mission? <laughs> Is it your network? Well, it's, part of it's my wife, Alex, and, and Kate, our other producer on the film. They just had lots of network and um, just uh, they're unstoppable kinds of people. Yeah, yeah. How do you like inspire these people to get on? Part of it was that we started with it. We had a, a conference called the Success Summit. We got a lot of these bigger names right off the bat. So then we would go out to the other people and say, hey, look, we've already interviewed X, Y, and Z big people. Wouldn't you like to be interviewed too? Uh, and I, I just think it it struck a tone, you know, this this notion of making a contribution. You know, Tony Robbins, he's, since his, he started, he's been feeding people. Uh, Thanksgiving is a story in his life where, where he was fed a, a Thanksgiving meal as a kid or his dad turned one away. And then he spent his whole life now, every Thanksgiving, feeding people, millions of people now. Mm -hmm. And so we talked to him about, well, how do you how do you get people to do that? How do you get other people to do that? They don't, they don't have to have your background and your story to take that on. And so he got enrolled really quickly and easily. And I think it just went like that, kind of from one person to the next. If we're doing good work together, I'll volunteer my time. Uh, seems to be the way that that yeah. went. Yeah, so we feel really lucky. I mean, I feel I, I kind of got a, a different education in my life um, by going out and asking people what they thought about this question. I got a lot of really deep philosophical answers. There's some amazing thinkers in the film that will kind of blow your mind with what they they talk about, and um, and then it, the film is meant to inspire people to ask themselves the question: Why am I here? What are my gifts? What's my purpose? What can I do? How can I make this world a better place? And so, I'm proud to have made it and proud that it's out there and people are watching it now. Amazing. How has this film changed the way you thought about this question originally or, or these questions? Like, has it, I, I guess, how has it changed you? How do you see this topic? Yeah. So we talked about meditation and when you meditate on something, you, you explore it. Well, I meditated on this topic for seven years. I, know. <laughs> I asked people this question over and like, over what again. What have you found in your seven years of going deep with this? It's interesting, um, like this conversation, like you're curious and I'm curious and we're both curious. We have a, we have this amazing moment, right? And that's what I did when I did, did the interviews for the film. I just, I just had conversations with people. I never had like fixed questions. I'd ask them about what they did. And, and then eventually we get to this point where almost always somebody had a story about a moment that they gave something or did something that really mattered in another person's life or somebody had done that for them. And I just got so clear to the kind of beauty of, of human life. You know, we have so many bad stories out in the press. There's so many things to worry about. But we have as many beautiful things going on and as many beautiful things to celebrate. It just doesn't make it in the press. It, it's not something that that works for that business. So I got to spend seven years finding out all the beautiful things that are going on in people's businesses and their 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 lives and and in this kind of larger thing, does the universe want us to do good? It's a big question. And I absolutely think, yes, I think the universe really wants us to. And when we do do things that are satisfyingly good for ourselves, and I don't have to tell you what that is for your life, but you do something that's really generous, it stays with you. Just like if you do something really not good, it stays with you as well. And those things add up over time. So you want to find somebody that's really a, a unhappy human being that's uh you know seems to be bitter and angry well they've they've had a lot of negative experience they've done things that they wish they hadn't done or people done things to them and it adds up well likewise the good things add up and they change and alter who you are 
even if you had a rough life up to now, maybe you've done some things you're not proud of, tomorrow or today, you can go to the grocery store and you know, make a generous offer or be kind to somebody or any number of things. The universe gives you a dozen opportunities to be a hero every day. Um, most of us are just busy or on our phones or something like that to not to notice our opportunity. And I think that's what the film taught me more than anything else is that it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if if the thing you do good is just a tiny little thing in a day or your business does, you know, gives millions or tens of millions of dollars to, to specific charities or wants to solve a world problem. It's the act of doing that that transforms us in the moment of doing it. And then we do it again and it transforms us again and we do it again and we transform us again and we start to be feeling connected to the world that was never possible through the metrics that society says are important. So if I make more money, it doesn't mean I get along my friends better. If I make more money, it doesn't mean that my, my city or my community or my neighborhood is better. But if I start doing things in my neighborhood, maybe I just sweep the, the porch in front of my building uh, or put some plants out. Here in, in the Netherlands, people put like plants out on the sidewalk. So and, cute. <laughs> I mean, it's just a plant, right? Yeah. When a lot of people would put a plant on the sidewalk, it's beautiful outside. Yeah. So these things are the things that matter and they, they do multiply in a way that's un, immeasurable. And, yeah. um, I, I love beautiful. that idea. And I think it helps people stretch beyond what they're used to, their daily routine. And this this starts me thinking about like, the ideal community, like the future of community. So I, I know you like to talk about that as well. It, obviously, ideally, if everybody went out and did random acts of kindness, put out plants on the street, we would have a more beautiful world. I don't know. What are your thoughts on how do we move forward in community and start to create like a, a more beautiful community that we all want to live in together? Because right now, everyone is so isolated. They only care about themselves. We just We have a certain culture. How do you move forward? Let's just imagine that for a minute. Um, so are you going to have a great community, let's say when there's, let's say, well, say, say you've got a community of 10,000 right now. Would you have a great community if 600 of the children of that community were starving every night, going to bed hungry? It's going to be hard to have a good community. Would you have, um, would you have a great community if 50 of the people couldn't afford critical health care that they needed to have. They had illnesses that they just couldn't go see a doctor because they couldn't afford to, to, to do that. Nope. Would you have a great community of 10,000 when 1,000 of those people don't have work? Or they have work that's really, really not nice work, work that doesn't feed them in any way, doing very menial tasks that don't enliven them. That would be really hard, right? So if we're going to imagine a community, first of all, let's just imagine that everybody's going to eat. All 10,000 people every day have access to good, healthy food, like with vegetables yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and protein and like all the things that you want to have, all the good things, right? And, and they're all going to have access to health care. They don't have to do anything for it. They're just going to have access to health care. And when we, when we make jobs, we're going to try to make it possible for people to have jobs that are fulfilling in some way that if I like to work in the garden, maybe I get to work in the garden for a living. But maybe... I don't have to do that to pay my rent. Oh, so if I can work and not have to use my work to just pay my rent, maybe it's just for extra money or things like that. Now I'm freed up. Now I actually have some time to consider doing good. That's a good start, I think. Just yeah. having people's basic needs taken care of so that yep. we don't have to struggle to survive. Yeah, because um, I think and, a lot of people are- And I think it dehumanizes us. Oh yeah, I was going to say a lot of people are too busy with their life to even think about helping. A lot of people would be helpful, but they're too burdened with their own responsibilities. Absolutely. Or burdened with the things they can't heal. Maybe they've had trauma in their life and nobody stepped up and said, hey, you know, like a trauma therapist could be really great for this. There's this cool thing called EMDR. You can move your eyes around and heal your trauma or here's meditation and here's, here's other things. So now we're maybe we're wounded in a different way other than physically. Um, and I want to say most of us are in one way or another. We're either wounded by our ancestral lineage, lineage trauma in our, our lineage or trauma from our parents, or we're wounded by something that happened to us in our teens or our 20s or our 30s. And because we don't have a natural world of, of taking care of one another and mental health being a, an everyday thing, we carry around those, those wounds and traumas. And so really, I think having great community starts with getting these basics taken care of in some way. And I, I know that sounds like a lot to a lot of people, 
But I want to make sure that that people don't think by just going and hanging out with their best friends or, hey, we're going to get a farm together that you're going to make community. Community exists. It's outside your door right now. It's not something that we build. We just attend to it. So it's like if you have a, a lot by your house and it's filled with weeds and tomorrow you go pull all the weeds and plant vegetables, you no longer have weeds in your community. You have vegetables, you have flowers, you have the things that you plant there. And so most of all, most important is to start planting things in your community and finding a ways to get to get those basic levels up-leveled. And that yeah. could mean political, political activation, all kinds of things that you can do to do that. Um, again, when you do that with people, shoulder to shoulder, body to body, then you, then you feel belonging and com- comradeship. Even if you're not successful, I want to say, if you're working to build better community, but you don't succeed, doing those things together really makes you feel like you belong and you're connected. Um, and, and that's not what our, our world is pulling for in many ways. We're, we're pulling, you know, the COVID didn't help and, social media and the phones don't help. We get isolated more and more. Hey, if you're listening to this podcast, go out and say hello to somebody today. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, I'm sure a lot of people want to start feeling like more community, but it's hard. Yeah, I guess the easiest way is just to go outside and meet someone new. (laughs) Do something nice for your neighborhood or your local community, right? It it starts small. A call for your friends to do something. Hey, let's go to the beach and do a beach cleanup next week. Or, hey, I heard there's a a problem down the street here. Let's, you know, we can do something about that. Could we could figure something out about that? Um, and then, you know, obviously you can't do all those things all the time, but if you can do some of them, some of the time, then some of the things get picked up and built and made better. Sometimes we also move communities. We find some place that's more aligned with our basic values. And, it's, and I understand it's, if you feel like you're countercultural and county countercultural in your town, like you're the oddball and the strange one out that looks at the world differently, you may have to find a a place that has more aligned values. I, I, I think that's okay. You don't have to stay where you are. Um, but you can make any place that you are, no matter what it's like, a better place. That's, oh, yes. the, that's the first step. Yes. Is that a bit of the reason why you moved to the Netherlands? Yeah. So um, what two things I find when I live in Europe, we always pick uh, to live in, in towns and kind of small to medium-sized towns. Uh, and we choose to live in the old part of town. Um, so cobble streets and things like that, but we do it mostly so that we can walk. Mm, um, yeah, the I, lifestyle. I moved back to the states, and every time we're living in the states, I'm in my car all the time. Yeah, um, I'm in this little bubble, and and you know, I know there's some cities, great walking cities in the United States, but many of them, especially in the West, are not great for walking. But here we have a car. Uh, sometimes we drive it to Spain or Italy or things like that. But I have to every every couple of weeks, I have to go outside and start it. <laughs> So that the battery doesn't run down because oh we drive it so rare. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. And that's, yeah, it's such a, because di- I'm in California. It's like in, in Europe, you have everything you need in a walking distance. It's, it, yeah, it is true. Like uh, this is a structural thing. Like some communities are structured differently. And so I think that that's also a part of like macro planning, right? In the future, how can we rebuild communities so that they fulfill us instead of, you know, the way we drive everywhere here is like, it's very isolating as well. You can't meet people. <laughs> no, um, no. And, and the Dutch are really funny. They, uh, uh, in the old houses, they have these big windows in the front of the houses and everybody leaves the window, the curtains open. And so you walk down the street and you're looking in somebody's living room. Obviously, off, sometimes it's their living room, their kitchen and, and into their back garden. You know, like you see right through it. Um, and then you're in your house and somebody will walk by just, just before this, uh, this recording, this podcast, I, I was uh, downstairs and, and I was, uh, I just pulled the blinds, get ready to pull the blinds down. Somebody walked by and he looked over at me and then he waved mm-hmm. in my house. I'm in my house. It's not <laughs> like we waved each other. He waved at me in my house and I yep. waved back and it, there was this feeling of like openness yeah. that I've never really felt in another place before. It's like, it's okay if you look in my house. It's, it's okay <laughs> to say hi to me. We are yeah. we're all live together in community. Yeah. Um, and so I, I thrive in those environments. Um, I thrive when I can go out to a little coffee shop or sometimes uh, we haven't yet here in, in Harlem where we are, which is near Amsterdam, uh, picked a little pub or a bar where we can go out you know, mm-hmm. a couple times a week and, and have a beer or a glass of wine or something like that to be around people. But those are really common cultural things uh, around here. So we feel very lucky to to borrow somebody else's culture to, to fit in and, and be a part of that. And then I get more enlivened in that 
that environment because I can. I'm a I'm a thinker and a creator, and so I can sit at my desk 24 hours a day doing things. But it's much better for me to be out in the world. So, um, yeah. Awesome. I I do want to bring up your upcoming book, The Futurists. Can you tell us what is the main takeaway from this book? Yeah, it's a book I've been working on for quite a while. Uh, it's it's like the thing I just led you. It's on these kind of bigger realizations about time. Um, one of the one of the underlying factors of being a human being is that we are temporal. We live in time. We have a beginning and we have an end. Everybody knows they have an end, whether they think about it or not. They know that there will be a time when they're no longer on the planet. And you could say, hey, the most important thing about my life is where I live or where I was born or what language I speak. But actually, that you were born and that you will die are probably the most significant things that ever happened to any human being in their life. And yet we don't think about time. And so it's, it's a book about being in time. And there's a lot of meditations and ways for people to actually tap into the notion of being a temporal being versus a physical being. What am I as an expression of time versus what am I as expression of space? And um, it seems to me that if we're just space, then we become a thing. And things are fixed. They don't change very well. Uh, things get old. Things uh, 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 get lost. Uh, all kinds of things happen to things. But if you're a time being, if you're a mm. being of time, the thing about time is it's always changing. Yeah. And every moment, everything's different. Everything's different every moment. If you think of yourself as being a component, your, your component structures of time, then your way of noticing and seeing the world begins to alter. And so it's, sort of, it's, it's an exploration. The whole book's an exploration of that. And I'm now thinking about taking it into two books and having one be about our being and really get like people grounded in how that is the time, and then one being a little more theoretical around time. But we'll see. I, I actually have a manuscript that's mostly done, but... I don't know if anybody out there has written a book. It seems like the closer you get to being done with it, the further away from being done with it you actually feel. <laughs> yeah. So um, <laughs> Wow. I mean, through the journey of writing the book, what new insights have you gotten? Like, I don't know. Tell us more about... I, I want to... I'm curious about this exploration of time being. So first of all, time is, is like fit water to a fish, right? If you, that's a great metaphor. You know, like a fish lives in water. Uh, you know, maybe if you're a fish that lives in a water in a in a river, you might think, "Hey, water is the thing that brings me food. It comes from up there and goes down there, and as as it brings things to me, that's what water is. It's a thing that brings food like this." But if you're a sea fish, maybe maybe water is something that swirls and has a deep part that's scary, and oh. there's a little zone of water that's good for you. Or if you're a, a, a lake fish, then water is something that's warm at the top and cold at the bottom. It's like the, each fish would have a completely different explanation for what water is. And all of them would be describing the qualities of water without actually describing water. And that's the way we are about time. I'll give you an example. Um, we think the past happened. And when we say the past happened, we mean that there's a physical representation of something that happened yesterday or two years ago, but there's not. There's only the things that are here today. That's kind of crazy if you think yeah. about it. It only the lives in our is, memory, if anything. It's only in your memory. There's yeah. no past. It's gone. <laughs> like a thing. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's not even that it's not gone. It's just not something. You're right. It's not a thing. All of mm -hmm. the things that you're experiencing in your life get experienced right now. Mm -hmm. they're, on, they're here right now. You have a superstition that they'll be here in a few minutes. <laughs> it's a superstition that seems to play out. But the truth is you've never gone into the future to see if they're still in the future because you can't. It's another thing that you could only see in your imagination. Now, most people get that pretty easy. They can only imagine the future. But they get, they, most of them think that the past is something. But it's only it's only a, a recollection, an imagination, so to speak. So I call this the ever-present past and the ever-present future. What's your past? It's the past you're thinking about right now. Whatever thing. If I said, Eileen, think of something that happened last week. Now, that thing that happened last week is present with you. Five minutes ago in the conversation, wasn't present. Wasn't there. Eileen, think of something that you're going to do, something exciting to do in the next couple of months. It wasn't there until I had you imagine it. Now it's here, so that's an ever-present future. 
okay, if we have this thing called an ever-present past, which is a past that we're paying attention to, and we have this thing called the ever-present future, which is the future we're imagining, imagining for ourselves or the world, then who are we? Are we an extension of the past? Are we, an, are we, are we something that's seeking a future? Well, I would say yes. We're all of that. We are a being that has these three tenses in us at the same time. Now, why? Why do human beings have a past vision and a future vision, an imaginated space, and then we have this present moment experience? I mean, some of the spiritual teachers used to tell us to be present, right? Be here mm -hmm. now. You can't help but be here now. That's the only thing you can do. It's yeah. impossible to be anywhere else. Now yeah. we can have our attention grabbed or whatnot. So if you meditate on that, you begin to really understand that what we tell ourselves about the past and what we tell ourselves about the future are really important. Now that doesn't mean that, that our experience didn't happen or that, that trauma didn't happen or our body didn't get affected and we may have to recontextualize some of that or do some healing because it's here now, not because it happened in the past, but because it's still with us now. But if you begin to think of yourself as having in your being this past and this future, you get a lot bigger. You get a lot bigger than I'm a linear from then to then to then to then thing. I'm this thing that has this incredible capacity for all time, any, any given moment. So uh, we'll, we have a bunch of meditations we're going to be releasing this, this spring on how to do that and what that might be like and how it might empower you, especially if you feel stuck in life, by the way. Time is not something that is stuck. Yeah. If you've ever tried yeah. to stop your clock or maybe move somewhere like you're late for a meeting and get there instantaneously, you'll find that, that time doesn't really care. <laughs> it just <laughs> keeps moving. Mm -hmm. um, so these are, these are ways to get in tune with that and have that be a little bit part, part of your consciousness and how you live and conduct your life. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. That was so like philosophical and I have to, it, it's something to like really take time to like sink in and think about. Um, I want to ask what would be the final message that you want to leave our audience with today? This is a really unique time we're living in. Uh, the things that are happening to us right now have altered what it means to be a human being. They've altered the way our world works. And, you know, like we have so many things happening that are, you know, used to be, you know, once in a lifetime events, whether it's climate things or uh, economic things, the, the pandemic. And, and just understand that it's okay if you feel turbulent because of that. This is a very anomalous time in human history. Inside of that time, know that we can change and do better. Know that we can respond to the worst crises that are facing us and we can overcome them. The way we do that is by each one of us giving our gifts, by being aligned with some purpose that's greater than ourselves, and understanding that together we are better. Together we are better. And uh, there is no one out there that's insignificant at this point in history. Everybody's needed to uh, pull together and pull the human race through this moment so that we can enter into a, a world that's more cooperative with the planet, more cooperative with the other species on the planet, more cooperative with each other. We, we have to give up the fight to uh, be the dominant species on the planet and, and join what's our heritage, which is we're part of nature. We're, we're a part of this, this thriving system, this amazing spaceship that we're traveling around the universe in. And um, yeah, blessings on you, really. Every one of those things, blessings on you. May you, uh, you know, have love and energy to make the world a better place today and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, lastly, where can we find you online? Uh, yeah, for personal development things, you can go to bold.ly, boldly. Uh, that's where we have all our materials for that meditation stuff and some courses, a wonderful course called Do What You Love, Change the World, which I think you get an idea what that might be about after talking to me. And then professional stuff, um, uh, I have two websites. I have one called The Generative Futurist, where you can see all my stuff that I'm doing about long-term futures. And we have a business that does futurism called The Futurist. That's at futurist.io. You can stalk me on Instagram. I'm always spouting off some beautiful philosophical nonsense on there. That's uh, it, it's how we said at the generative futurist, and um, 
yeah, in different conferences and events around the world. If uh, if you bump into me and you heard this podcast, uh, say hi, and uh, we'll both reminisce about how amazing of a show host Eileen was. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. This was such a beautiful conversation, very empowering, inspiring. And I I just want to say that I am optimistic about the future that you see. And I I honestly think through this podcast, we've, you know, you've spread your light and the people listening, they're going to share their gift with the world. It really is a ripple effect. And I'm excited about that. Yeah. Yeah, I, we do it together. We bring yes. each other up together for sure. Yes. Uh, thank you for having me, Eileen. I really enjoyed the conversation. 